forward. There we are. Um, this will be um, up on YouTube on our St. John's YouTube channel probably within the next day or so. Um, I'll go over just a few little bits of Zoom etiquette first. First, my name is Claire Dodd. If you're having any um, technical difficulties, feel free to message me in the chat and I will see if I can work some magic. Um, folks, as they're being um, admitted into the Zoom, they will be muted. So if y'all could stay muted, um, just so that we don't get too much feedback or ambient noise while Dan is talking. If there will be a time for Q&A at the very end. So if you come up with a question while Dan is talking, feel free to go ahead and pop that into the chat and we will go over them at the end, or if you want to pop some comments in the chat, feel free to please go ahead. Um, this is being put together by the front porch at St. John's, and we'll have a bit more information about that later, and I'll pop a link to all of our upcoming events as well in the chat, and I'll do that towards the end. But for now, Dan, take it away. Well, thank you, Claire. Uh, this is, um, everybody needs a Claire Dodd in their lives. She is the mm -hmm. assistant to the rector at St. John's Episcopal Church, a historic Episcopal Church in downtown Tallahassee. Mm -hmm. She is superb. And she's taking my um, musings and meanderings and put them together tonight in a uh, PowerPoint, which I've never done. I'm no techie. So uh, thank you, Claire, for all you've done. And uh, I think with that, um, let's see, let me see if I get some notes here. Um, so I've said thank you to Claire, to St. John's Front Porch. By the way, we have our website there for St. John's website or for the Front Porch website, which has been worked on now for about four years. And it's an ecumenical uh, place where you come for just spiritual direction. Or if you're hungry for the spiritual life, it's a good place to hang out, uh, both in person and over Zoom. So thank you. All right, I think I'll get started now if it's all right with everyone. Um, I'm going to give a quick overview of the talk of tonight. Uh, the topics are travels with a Trappist monk. I've met many of you through my travels with Father Manager. Would have not have met so many contemplatives around the country, outside the country, but for Father William. So what we'd like to do here this evening is I have about six or seven uh, lessons I'd like to share with you. The years that I traveled with Father William were a great gift to me. And I've spent now several weeks, a month, trying to pull all this together. But there's really no way to pull together what I've witnessed and what I've been a party to, but for the work of the Holy Spirit. So I'd like to talk tonight about God's humor as a first lesson. For all you A-plus students in your classes, I'm sure everybody was. You all graduate at the top of your class. I'm going to talk about God's humor. I'm going to talk about of what's given. I'm going to talk about traveling altars. Uh, I'm going to talk about every man's, every person's monk, everyone's monk. Uh, we'll talk about how Father William taught me to die. That'll be at the end. By the way, there's going to be a very special blessing um, <laughs> after that last um, section, and then we'll open it up for a conversation or Q&A, okay? So if everyone's silence, we'll move ahead. All right, first, first slide, Claire, please. I guess you're my Vanna White tonight. Nope, it's the Jung quote, there we go. Thank you. We'll take a minute. In the end, the only events of my life worth telling are those when the imperishable world erupted into this transitory one. We also call that grace, we call that God moments. But for me, it's um, the way I got started with Father William. Okay, Claire, we can take that if everyone's seen it. I, years ago, I started going to snow mass like many of you did. I never met Father William. He was coming to Destin. I heard there was a monk coming from Destin. I met Father Thomas Keating, I met the abbot. But so several of us went over to Destin, Florida, which is about a three hour drive from here. I was so taken with Father William's teachings, I knew I was in the presence of a wise man and I couldn't get close enough to his teachings. Well, Barbara Resmere from Church of the Resurrection in um, Myanmar 
where they were having a parish retreat. So I met Barbara on this retreat and I said, Barbara, I would love an hour with Father Menninger if I could. I was deep into the journey. I mean, things were just happening like it has with all of us. And she said, yeah, Dan, we can set that up for you. Come over on uh, Friday and you can take him out for lunch for an hour. I said, fine. A few days before that, this is a sense of God's humor. I get a call from Barbara saying, Dan, Father uh, Menninger's host for the weekend can't entertain him, can't take him out this weekend and be with him. Is that something you would like to do? I said, of course I would. <laughs> you would drop, you'd move everything, right? To go be with a monk. Well, as it turned out, instead of having an hour, I had my first weekend with him. And I went over for the parish retreat. At the end of the parish dinner that Thursday before I was to pick him up on that Friday, he turns to everyone and says, I want you to get a good look at this guy. He's been tailing me for a week now. I don't know who he is, but someone get his license plate in case I don't come back. So that began my story and that's God's humor because God does erupt into our lives, right? When we least expect it, it's all grace, but this was a humor part or it's humorous when I started uh, traveling with Father William, the way that it happened, that I was only to see him for an hour, then it turns out for a weekend. Well, I get in the car with him the next morning. All of a sudden, I think he's a prosecutor just examining me, you know, cross-examination. I'm on the hot seat about who I am and what I do and everything. And I said, well, it's just all God's grace. And he says, don't give me that. Tell me some of your stories. I did. He liked those stories. Then we stopped for a good old American breakfast. Uh, at the Waffle House, which he loved. And he said, Dan, do you know the rule of St. Benedict? I said, a little bit. He says, well, when you're away from the monastery and you held up the menu, the rule of St. Benedict is you can have anything to eat that's placed in front of you. So the menu was placed in front of me, so he ordered his favorite meal, right? Eggs, bacon, those sorts of things, because they don't, they don't eat that at the monastery. Um, and I think, too, that you'll remember, hopefully you'll remember your own God moments. I think a lot of these lessons are universal. They've happened to us all, right? So um, that's, that's the other point. Oh, by the way, too, and I think, Claire, we have Father Menninger's memorial card. If anyone would like his memorial card that was done by Spencer Abbey uh, outside of Boston, if you'll send, and Claire will put her email address up there. I'll put mine there, or Claire, you'll put mine, please. And if you'll let us know if you would like a um, electronic copy of his memorial card. It's really a fascinating thing about his life because it's not my intent here tonight to go into his books, to go into his teachings. You've been on his uh, retreats, you've heard his lectures. If you haven't, I invite you to do that. Um, um, Ed Babcock has set up a YouTube channel for Father William. There's lots out there. So my intent tonight is just to share some personal stories about Father William, and many include you. All right, Claire, I think we're ready now for the uh, second slide, please. Abitur vovus. It shall be given you. This is one of Father William's um, teachings. I first received it from him, I think, when we were in uh, Seattle. He went on to give it to the Harvard um, Divinity School at Spencer Abbey. Um, most of you all know these um, abbeys, Snowmass. It's called St. Benedict's Abbey. It's in Snowmass, Colorado. That's where Father Thomas Keating was. It's where Father William was. But the mother house is called Spencer. It's called St. Joseph's Abbey. It's outside of Boston, about an hour and a half. I said Joseph's, yeah. Yep. Uh, someone, all right. So, but a lot's happened at those two monasteries. This is where the Center of Prayer Movement began at Spencer in 1974. But a lot of you all have, I think someone needs to, be muted, please. Thank you. But many of you have been on retreat at Snowmass. For those of you, as this, if this is an introduction to many of you, 
I think we'd suggest that do it a retreat at Snowmass. Lots of things happen there at Snowmass. So it's important to do those little 10 day silent retreats wherever you might be in your journey. Well, Dabitur Vobus, it shall be given you. Father William gave a talk, gave a homily actually, at St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in Seattle. Cherry Hastings was involved with Contemplative Outreach there. She was hosting us. Um, Mike Regis was there. But William, at the end of the retreat that weekend, gave a talk on the Trinity. But the talk that he had planned, he didn't give. He set his notes down and started talking. And it was a very Holy Spirit moment. The reason I'm building, bringing this up is you might be able to find um, his sermon, his homily on the Holy Trinity uh, in Seattle. But he says, Dan, I set it down because the Holy Spirit gave me that talk that day. He knew it. I knew it. Everybody in the congregation knew something special was happening. And he's always, and when he had uh, the uh, Harvard Divinity School there, I think I wasn't privy to that. He did that at uh, Snow or at uh, Spencer Abbey outside of Boston. But that's a that's something that you ought to look for in your own lives, or if you don't haven't already encountered it. Now, I'll give some other examples about Dabi Torvobus. We were in Yakima, Washington on retreat. There were three um, Catholic priests, one a monk, that's Father William, still active. They're all in their 80s. Monsignor Jack Ecker was head of the, uh, still head of the Co Cathedral in Yakima, Washington. Uh, Steve Cohen is now retired. But he, Father William, and Jack were close friends. So when we were in Yakima, Washington, putting on a parish retreat, I dropped Father William off one evening by the hotel. And I said, William, and you'll pardon me, friends. Um, he and I were close, close friends. I knew him on a first name basis, as many of you do. Uh, and that's why he was everyone's monk. You just, he didn't, uh, he was approachable. So. I was talking with William as he got out of the car. I was gonna go park. I said, William, I want to continue your work. And he said to me, Dan, I'm not interested in your continuing my work. I'm interested in you continuing your work. Well, that holds true for all of us, doesn't it? Dabi Tor Bovis, this talk tonight, I struggled with it for a month. Nothing was coming, nothing was coming. Well, hopefully this will be what the Holy Spirit intended. If it was, we give uh, glorious to the Holy Spirit. If not, we can blame Dan for getting in the way of the Holy Spirit. Uh, another thing, and I think I might have some friends here from, uh, from the living school. Uh, this part of this Darby Tor Vobus is, what's been given to us? What's been given to you? what's been given to me, right? And how do we take what's been given to us? How do we take that? And this is a Richard Rohr teaching, and I'm sure everyone knows Richard Rohr. So Richard, how do you take what's been given to you and join it with the suffering of the world? So as we come to the end of this talk, as we come near the end of it, with William's suffering, he took his suffering and joined it with the suffering of the world. We're all called to take our suffering and join it with the suffering of the world. And we do that through our centering prayer or through whatever meditation practice we have, or we can do it in our act of contemplation and in, in, in helping the poor, feeding the poor, visiting the sick, uh, going to hospice, those sorts of things. Um, all right, Claire, let's go to um, slide number three, please. Traveling altars. I was trying to count up today how many cities I've been to with Father William. So if you take the major cities in the US, East Coast, West Coast, North, South, in the middle, minor cities, um, I've been there with Father William. And he was there many times before me. 
as Father William began aging out, he couldn't travel. So when I met him that one time in Bessa and spent the weekend with him, I invited him to Tallahassee for a retreat. He said yes. And, as, and I came back, we put together a committee. Many of you are here on the Zoom talk tonight. We put together a committee and we had Father William here. He came back eight times, eight annual visits. He did the annual uh, Ash Wednesday talk at Faith Presbyterian Church. He often said that um, Tallahassee gave him the ecumenical peace. So I wanna talk about this, his chalice and we'll talk about traveling altars and I'll talk about this award. This is a chalice and I think maybe we'll just go to, uh, uh, the, well, I think we can let go of the um, screen share now. Thank you, Claire. This is the chalice that Father William made, okay? I don't know if you can see it. And this, he made this in 1978. He made eight of these. I'm the recipient of one of these when I packed him up from Snowmass Monastery back in 2018. Um, Spencer Abbey has several. Snowmass Monastery has several. His sister has one. His friend, Father Jack Yecker, the Monsignor in Yakima has one. And Father Steve Cohen, who's now retired priest from Cape Cod, has one. This is Steve Cohen's, which he gave back to Father William when we were there seeing him because he's moving on to a uh, retirement home for priests in uh, Boston. So I'm the lucky recipient of this mug or mug, to, uh, this chalice. I did want to show, this is the award that Father William received in 1978 for that chalice. And I'm gonna read the back of it to you. It's the Maurice Lavano Award. Maurice Lavano was a well-known architect in New York City, probably internationally known. And it says this, to Father William Menninger, OCSO, for original contribution in American art by the New England Liturgical Committee. And the front of it says, sacredness, nobility, universality, and the three inscriptions down here are, so water live. And each year on the anniversary of the founding of Spencer Abbey, they will use Father William's chalice to celebrate uh, mass. Let's talk about altars. When we would travel, William had his, his uh, communion kit with him, but we'd also sometimes, he would make one. And Ken Keeney is on here. Ken, I don't know if you know this or not, but when I was packing up Father William in Snowmass back in October of 2018, and he gave me the chalice, I asked him about the linen cloth that he always had for the altars we would build, that he would build whenever we give mass, whenever he, whenever he uh, celebrated mass. Pardon me, I'm, I'm a Protestant for my Catholic friends. I don't quite, uh, even though I've traveled and hung out with all, all you Catholics, I love you Catholics, but I don't quite uh, get the wording right sometimes. But Father William used to correct me ever so often on that. So Father William uh, had this linen cloth and uh, Ken, he gave that to Eric. Eric Ken, he gave that to your son. Yes, I do remember that. Do you have it? I don't know if we you do. have it. Well, if you can find it, perhaps you could show it to everyone, okay? Because this, this, this lesson here is we can all build our own communion tables, our own altars, okay? This linen tablecloth came from Jerusalem. It was a prized possession. Now, Father William didn't have much. He got his clothes out of goodwill for whoever didn't buy him clothes. And several of us, several of you all provided clothes to Father William and did things for him. I could always tell when I was traveling with Father William, if his son, if Eric, if the monk Eric Keeney packed up Father William, he looked like a haberdasher monk. He looked like a GQ monk. Otherwise, 
we were at the sufferance of his friends wherever we were going. Um, so can you let us know when you get that, all right? And I will tell you this, Dan, we are going to, it's been difficult losing yes. Eric. Yeah, I know. And we're going to uh, Thanksgiving weekend. We're going to go through his things. Okay. His, uh, our youngest son, Chris, is coming in and he's got uh, a lot of Father William's uh, memorabilia and Father Thomas's too. And we're going to go through that. Uh, um, so I will definitely get that aside and get on a Zoom with y'all to see that. Good. You know what? Maybe we, Unfortunately, we don't have a relic of Father Thomas or, or, or Father William. <laughs> I will, I will, I'm, I'm, I can't wait to see what the treasures he has. Uh, yeah. You know, he was well, very close to both of them. And, uh, well, he was. He, he cherished his time with them. Yes. Yeah. That's a, so thank you. Uh, their son, Eric, um, just recently passed away over the July 4th weekend. So we still say prayers for, for Ken and Carol and his son and, and for Eric, he was a great leader in the church. Thank you. In fact, he, he took care of Father Keating at Spencer in the skilled nursing unit for six months for a year. He was on the uh, health wing of Stomass Abbey Monastery uh, for a long time too. So uh, Eric was a great servant of the Lord, much beloved. So on building your own altar, so William had had this linen cloth from Jerusalem that he'd gotten. He'd have some chalices or people that we were staying with might have a chalice. So people had brought things back from, from Jerusalem or from uh, so that we would use. And we have a friend of ours from La Jolla who's now in Rome. Donna's not gonna join us tonight because of the time change, but she loved, it's a special time to celebrate um, the mass with Father William, whether it's in private, or if you're on retreat, because you would gather everyone up and to break bread and to offer up the mass. It was just a wonderful spiritual experience. And he'd always say that um, uh, Jesus said these words, take, eat this all of you. And the buzz on retreats, I'm sorry, I don't hope they don't dig him up and, uh, Burn him at the stake for this. But it's kind of a don't ask, don't tell, right? But he was he was very um, very welcoming in sharing God's love. So you can build I have my own um, uh, my own uh, altar here that sits next to my prayer chair. It's from some elements that were brought back from Jerusalem. Uh, that Donna, in fact, gave me. I've got a, an icon that I brought back from Turkey that sits uh, next to a, uh, a rock that's a special place, maybe from, um, from Adams Peak or from uh, Mount Sinai. So you can use your imagination, but what we're doing is we're bowing to the holy, right? It's always, we're honoring the holy with this. And it's nothing sacrilegious about it. It's being present to God who is always present to us. And especially now with Zoom, when we're doing Holy uh, Eucharist, Holy Communion by Zoom, that's what I've used to celebrate um, with others. All right, um, Claire, let's go on to the next. Next slide, please. Unless we have some, well, we'll come back to questions later on. Jadavif with wisdom. Anybody know that monk? Michelle Lowe, I received an email. This is, this is Davi Torvobus, guys and, and women. Sorry for the informality, men and women. Um, pilgrims along the way. Michelle Lowe is with Dallas Contemplative Outreach. We stayed with her in Dallas when Father William and I were there putting retreats. So we're emailing back and forth. I was asking her some questions. And at the end of an email, very lengthy email, I, that I didn't see the first time. But I came back and I noticed at the second viewing of the email, and that's how she knew Father William. I think we all knew Father William as that way. Joie de vivre with wisdom, the joy of life. Okay, Claire, 
Thank you. The joy of life with wisdom. Isn't that what attracted us to Father William? What's the lesson here? What's the lesson we learned? It was okay. He, he, was, he was happy. He was joyful. And he did it on behalf of the kingdom. Now, Father William was a one on the Enneagram. So what I would like to do in this part of the talk is to share some things about Father William, some of my own experiences with him, and then we'll see how that Jean de Vivre ties in. For those of you who are familiar with the Enneagram, it's the perfectionist. And then, but Father William had a lot of seven in him. Seven is the enthusiast, is the kind of the traveler, uh, the Peter Pan. But Father William always mistook himself as a number seven for the first couple of years. But here's why the Enneagram is important. So we can talk about centering prayer. We can talk about his process of forgiveness, his, uh, his Enneagram, his girlfriend, Julian of Norwich, uh, the Psalms, the Gospels. But Father, I want to talk about the Enneagram for just a minute. And Father Wallace from St. John's Episcopal, it's on our YouTube website, right, Claire? He did a talk about five or six weeks ago on the Enneagram. It's worth going to. It's an hour long, hour and a half long presentation, introduction to the Enneagram, if you aren't familiar with it. You'll also see Father William on YouTube on the Enneagram. Here at St. John's, we, on his first trip here, we had 175 people show up for his Enneagram workshop that day. It was incredible. And that they were that evening we're leaving St. John's. It was just such a uh, such a joy-filled room that day, along with lunch and everything. I said, William, what a great thing this is. And he said, Dan, I haven't done anything. It was here waiting for me. I get goosebumps when I tell that story. It's another example of Dabitur Vobis. It shall be given. We had no idea who was going to be at these retreats, what sort of reception he was going to have uh, that first year. But coming back to the Enneagram, I think that's what attracted us to Father William. He liked to have, when he was out, away from the monastery, and people would take him out to dinner, have him in their homes. He loved to be taken out to a dinner, have a glass of wine with you, have conversation. Isn't that, isn't that the Mass? Isn't that communion? where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also. He relished in that. But part of that Enneagram, what I would like to share with you, he was always the distinguished lecturer for this chair. He was the invited special guest for this special presentation all across the country, right? We were in Washington, the state of Washington at a university where he is the distinguished lecturer that evening for this annual talk they give. Well, we arrive at the campus that day, golf cart meets us, we're met by the president, we're met by the abbot, and we zoom off in the golf cart to the, um, to the dorm where the monks live, to the cells. Well, we walk Father William up there, I take his bags, I get back in the golf court, and they're taking me down to the uh, guest house. Well, folks, it's the presidential suite. It's got the Palladium windows overlooking the uh, campus. It's got, uh, you know, these beautiful sofas, uh, big screen TV, wet bar, Queen Anne bed, you know, in the back. I mean, it's, all, it's where the dignitaries stay. And I thought, well, heck, this is pretty good. I kind of like this. Well, all of a sudden, there's a knock at my door. I open the door and there stands Father William along with the abbot saying, Dan, he, takes, he took one look around the room with the fireplace and the palladium windows. He says, Dan, this is my room. Find yourself someplace else. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, that's the Ja de vivre, right? That's the joy. That's, but he could do those sorts of things. Um, but that evening, there were 150, 200 people at his talk that evening. And it was on models of contemplation. 
That day we'd been in a professor's room, classroom, talking with his class, lifelong Catholic professor. That evening, after Father Menninger's talk, and Father William is being wheeled around in a wheelchair to get around him because otherwise it's my cane, he comes up to him and builds, kneels down by Father William and says, I'm a lifelong Catholic. I have never heard the gospel preached this way. You see, that's joie de vivre with wisdom. He met us where we were on our journey, didn't he? I mean, that's why, that's why we couldn't get him nuts with Father William. That's why I followed him around that weekend at Destin. I knew that I was in the presence of someone special. And then that developed into a friendship. And he and I, I think I joined his inner circle of close friends with Jack Ecker and Steve Cohen. And we would tell each other we loved each other towards the end of his life. It was such a wonderful thing to be befriended by a monk who was a wise man, but who enjoyed each and every one of you. He remembers you, he knew you, wherever we were, he would ask about you. Um, one last, um, oh, Delta. I'd book Father Williams tickets along with mine. We'd meet in Atlanta, Salt Lake City. I, it got to a point where I'd have to fly to Aspen to pick him up, okay? But we always flew Delta because like many of you, I have medallion status with Delta. Well, I always booked our tickets for Delta Comfort because he's getting all the cane, can barely see. But sometimes, frequently, I'd get bumped up to business class, right? Because of my uh, status with Delta. Well, I'm a two on the Enneagram, the helper, the helper. I give mine to William, right? So we'd be the first on the plane because we boarded with the wheelchair. He'd be, uh, I would tell the flight attendant who he was and she's seating him there in business class. And I'd be walking back to get my seat. And he'd say to her, he'd say, you see that guy right there? Close a curtain after he gets out of business class and don't let him talk to me during the flight. Just a joy, right? Just a joy. The other thing that we did on the Delta flights, especially the early morning flights was, we would have a coffee with Bailey's. So he, we always had a coffee with Bailey's. He just loved that. And he's also partial to the Delta Sky Club. He loved the Delta Sky Club. So sometimes when you're zooming through airports, right? You're trying to make a connection. We'd still stop, right? I see Larry grinning, Larry and Mary Wyman. They, they know this to be true, right? Several of y'all know this to be true, but he enjoyed life, right? So, but I'm gonna come to, to a serious point about Delta here, okay? And you have to remember the monks at the monastery, they're, it's bread and water and vinegar, right? Not quite that bad, but he used to say that. Uh, in fact, the uh, chef at the Spencer is quite a guy uh, and they have one main meal a day. But one year, I mean, when we started traveling, he came in, we were in New York City and he was staying there at St. Joseph's uh, Church. It's a beautiful church right there by Washington Square. We we're upstairs being entertained by the Catholic priest. Priests were flying in and out of the country. Uh, Stand at the rectory there. We had a beautiful cookout. He said, you know, Dan, today I was doing my centering prayer and I incorporated all the noise of the city here in the village up in my prayer. Well, whenever we'd go through the airports, we'd be at the gate. He'd be in the wheelchair. And he'd say to me, Dan, it's time for centering prayer. I never did centering prayer in the gatehouse of any airport, but I learned that from William. And so that's my lesson. That's this lesson of joie de vivre with wisdom. You can do centering prayer anywhere. What we take with noise is, is we lift it up into the cloud, into the cloud of unknowing, right? Um, so as much as Delta meant to us through the Sky Club and through Bailey's and business class, it meant more to him and to me He'd be doing centering prayers we sat by the gate waiting to be boarded. Um, 
And oh, who can forget Father William's flower cards, right? Uh, there's Mary, I, I can't see all, there's May again shaking her head. Monks support themselves. They, they put on retreats, they have, um, uh, you know, they, it's aura et labora, prayer and labor. So they make, they make their, uh, their earnings by the living of their hands, right? Well, Snowmass does uh, retreats. They also grow um, this premium holiday quay, uh, hay for horses. Um, and William made, um, made flower cards. And this is from Mike Matuzzi in uh, Kansas City. That's, that's the, uh, we did the, this, by the way, there's a great teaching that Father William did, if you don't know the land of Oz with Dorothy, because we're everybody in Dorothy, but we don't have time to get into that. But Father William, put a flower card on the back of it for me. So, but the, uh, the teaching on the, um, on the uh, Wizard of Oz and our journey as Dorothy is in his book, The Process of Forgiveness. You'll see that there. Okay, how are we doing on our time? Because I want to leave time for some, um, so for some conversations, some questions and answers. Let's talk, let's move on now to the next slide, please. Two thousand and eighteen was a watershed moment in William's life, in the life of the abbot, Father um, Joseph Boyle, who's probably the finest abbot of the Trappist border in his day. He'd been at Snowmass since he was age eighteen. Um, Joe died at 76 or 78. Carl, you have to help me about that. He dies on October 21st, 2018. Father Thomas Keating dies at Spencer on October the 25th, 2018. I'm going to back up now because this is Father Menninger, Leon Bloy. I'm going to read Leon Bloy's quote. Here's a French novelist who lived uh, in the 1900s. We never talked about who Leon Bloy was. But if you'll, if you'll do a wiki on him, he was influential at Vatican II uh, for the approach to, um, um, to Israel. And Pope Francis mentioned Leon Bloy, mentioned a quote by Leon Bloy in his first homily as Pope. And Leon Bloy was quite a character, quite a writer, a novelist, an essayist. Uh, got in a little bit of trouble, but he, but he lived a, um, an interesting, well-lived life. So the quote that Father William came to are, is this. There are vacancies in the heart which do not yet exist, but await the emergence of suffering so that they may come into existence. Father William's wisdom, because we all know his wisdom, was to take people's teachings, whether it be the gospel, whether it be Lexio Divina, whether it be novels, but he could, he could take those teachings and put them into a wisdom saying. This is Father William's wisdom saying and one that he lived until he died. There are vacancies, spaces for love in the heart, which do not yet exist, but await the emergence of suffering so that they may come into existence. Remember we, when, we, when I introduced the uh, Dabi Tor Bovis, it shall be given you. His suffering was given to him, but he used his suffering for love, which is the same thing that Richard Rohr teaches, right? And that's, that's something for us all. How do we take what's been giving us our suffering and how do we join it with the suffering of the world, okay? 60% of the world's children go to bed with distended stomachs and because they don't have enough food every night. Um, so in 2018, prior to the abbot's death, we were on retreat in, um, outside of Biloxi, uh, not Biloxi, in uh, Jackson with uh, uh, Chris and Rob Mink. Large retreat, Father William had just had eye surgery. Father William had macular degeneration. He was going blind. And he had out, 
I had offered to take him to a premier eye clinic. Pam Leslie, who's on this talk from here, knew a premier eye surgeon from Miami. She offered to get him fixed up with, but he instead went to a small community hospital outside of uh, Snowmass and, and had some uh, surgery, hopefully to help him with his macular degeneration. It didn't work. I go to Aston to pick him up. We get on the airplane. I've got his meds with us and we go to uh, Jackson. There are about a hundred people there from Arkansas, Mississippi, uh, Louisiana, and um, maybe Arkansas, I'm forgetting one state. Big weekend. And he loved to do the meet and greet before he started doing the teachings the next day. He went to supper that evening. After supper that evening, he went to the teaching the next morning. But prior to the teaching next, next morning, I always stayed next door to him in the room. I always stayed close by, whether it was in hotels or um, abbeys or wherever we were, I stayed close by to Father William. That night, in the middle of the night, I hear this on the wall. I go running next to him, I say, yes, yes, William. He says, Dan, sit with me. He is having horrendous pain. Just awful pain. And I want to call the monastery. I want to call our host, Chris and Rob, to get him a doctor. I want to go uh, get him the right meds to alleviate this pain because we didn't have the pain meds, okay? He wouldn't hear of it. He sat there and suffered through that evening. The next day, we went down there and he had me sit next to him and he did the whole retreat from memory. His mind was that sharp. Now, he went to Harvard Divinity School. He went to Boston College for a seminary, went to Harvard Divinity School as a uh, cleric in residence. They don't get, they're not granted degrees, but you get to go. So he lived in a, in a Catholic um, uh, rectory there close by the campus, which I've been to. He's been to Seattle University, just a very, very bright man. So, okay, Claire, I think we can take this down now, the slide. So that year we come back from the retreat in Mississippi. We have retreats for uh, the Dominican Republic and the ashram of the Bahamas. It's clear to me he's not gonna be able to do it. We come back to Snowmass, that's in May. His health begins deteriorating. I told you about the, two, the abbot and Father Thomas Keating dying. Father William's health is deteriorating. He then moves back to Spencer Abbey uh, on November the 1st and we attend Father Keating's funeral after we'd attended Father um, uh, Boyle's funeral at Snowmass. But he continued to go downhill, to slow glide downhill. And Father William would tell this to everyone. I mean, one day before retreat, he had had um, uh, some cancer removed. He did a retreat a week later after, his, after he had cancer surgery. He, had, he, he did a retreat the day before he, he died, a week after he'd had a heart catheterization. And he's 88 years old, friends. This is not a young monk. But he, I never heard Father William complain about his health. That knock on the door that evening to come and sit with him. And then the other complaint I heard from him, not a complaint, but more of a lament was Dan, I don't want to go blind. He did go blind. And the last two retreats he put on by Zoom, he did from pure memory. And that's what he was made of. But Father William, the last retreat we gave was on February the 13th. 2020, no, 2021, this year, 2021, right? Right, Nancy? It was this year, 2021. I talked with him that day before he did the retreat, the Zoom retreat. The nurse said he shouldn't be doing this. He said he was going to do it. He did it. I talked with him that evening about eight o'clock. And, and you all will know this from going to Snowmass, but I want to share this with the group. Because we, William and I always share this every night before we said goodnight. 
when you're walking out of Vespers at Snowmass, Joseph, Joe, the abbot, would sprinkle the monks with holy water and then sprinkle those on retreat or the guests with holy water. And he would say these words, may you have a quiet night and a peaceful death. That evening, and that evening when, when Father William and I hung up from our conversation that night, we told each other we loved each other. And one of us would say, a quiet night, and the other would say, and a peaceful death. The next morning, Valentine's Day, Father William had a peaceful death in his room at Spencer Abbey. How fitting it is for a monk who shared God's love, who shared God's love universally with anybody, with everybody. It didn't matter what station of life you were from or what faith you came from. He shared God's love. And so before we get to our conversation, I have a, uh, I'd like to give everybody the special blessing and you'll just read the special blessing to yourself, okay? And then we'll open it up for a conversation. So thank you all for being here, for listening. I hope I haven't talked too long, but by the way, Claire has made me a Zoom host and co-host. So those who, of you who want to stay after eight o'clock, you're welcome to stay, okay? Claire, we're ready for uh, a special guest appearance for the blessing. Um, and thank you for that moment of silence. That picture was taken of Father William in Chicago. On retreat, I wasn't on that one, but he sent it to me. So Father Carl, I almost sent that picture to you, ask you if it was okay. But you know, he embodies joie de vivre, and that's by the way, for you all who don't know this, that blessing is Father William's blessing. He ended every email with that. May you be happy. May you be free. May you be loving. May you be loved. I know that he blesses each and every one of us with that blessing here this evening because he would want you to live his life as fully as he lived his. And he loved you, he recalls you, and he enjoyed every moment with you. Glory to the Father and to his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to the Holy Spirit that dwells within our hearts, both now and forevermore. Amen. All right, we'll break it open for some conversation or some questions. Claire, do we have any questions? No, none in the chat. We've had some comments about things uh, very beautiful. Had a couple of requests for the um, memorial, so we will get those out to y'all. Um, but yeah, um, any questions, feel free to either pop it in the chat or Take yourself off mute. Um, there's 57 of us here, so um, there may be a little bit of talking over each other, but we will do our best to get to everyone. So um, yes, have at it. Claire, I was, thinking, I was thinking too that we might, uh, for those of you who join the conversation, Perhaps you'd like to share a lesson you learned from Father William. Yeah. And Megan's raised a very good point. I will stop the recording. Um, and I'll press that right. Oh, I forgot about Dan, that. 